I want to talk today about the, the, the big ideas of evolution uh, and how they relate to genes, because that's part of the topic of your, of your whole session here. And I also want to talk about why evolution is such an important part of the curriculum in middle school and high school, and why uh, it really having an evolutionary orientation really improves your ability to, to get the information into your students' heads. We always start at my office in the beginning. Um, of course, when Darwin wrote on the origin of species and the other materials that he wrote subsequently, he was concerned to make two points, that descent with modification, common ancestry, evolution had happened, and that natural selection was the main engine bringing about this change. Not the only, he, wasn't, uh, he was not dogmatic about evolution, but you know, evolution was, was the most important of the mechanisms. And there's sort of an interesting historical relationship here because the idea of common ancestry was accepted very quickly. It was already in the air. Darwin just nailed it down so well with so many reasons to accept the inference of common ancestry that his colleagues and, interestingly enough, also the Christian clergy in Great Britain, very quickly, within, um, within a decade in the science community, community, within two decades in the religious community, accepted the idea that living things had had common ancestors. Natural selection turned out to be the more problematic of Darwin's ideas because natural selection during Darwin's day did not have the genetic underpinning that we understand it has today, and that, of course, is the result of 20th century investigations. Um, the uh, people that you uh, are very familiar with, not just Gregor Mendel, but also the um, architects of the, uh, of the um, uh, synthesis of, edu of, of evolution. And um, as a result, today natural selection is recognized as an extraordinarily important evolutionary mechanism. But it really took that, you know, it really took decades before that was the case. But the reason I bring this up is because um, there's a difference between evolution as a phenomenon, as something that happened, the common ancestry of living things, and the mechanisms that bring it about. There is also a third component of evolution, and that's the uh, patterns of evolution, how the tree of life is branched through time. Um, I want to talk about the three parts of evolution, the big idea of evolution of common ancestry, uh, and also the patterns of evolution, the ev natural selection being the most important, but obviously there are many other factors that affect evolutionary change. And then finally, the third component of evolution is the patterns. So evolution, pattern, and process are three virtually independent ideas. When you think about it, the data and theory, if you will, the evidence that Darwin used to convince his colleagues that living things had common ancestors was very different from the evidence that he attempted to, con to persuade them for natural selection. And, of course, very little was known about the fossil record during Darwin's day, so that really didn't figure in a whole lot, although there's a most interesting chapter on, on the uh, fossils. But, you know, we know so much more about fossils uh, today than Darwin did at his time. But the, the kind of, of research that, um, uh, shall we say, process uh, evolutionary biologists, uh, th those who are working on the mechanism, how does evolution work, um, they are working generally with a very different kind of set of data. Um, they are working on different kinds of problems than you would use to demonstrate that, human anse or that, that uh, common ancestry actually occurred. Similarly, those um, paleontologists and uh, uh, other evolutionary biologists who are trying to figure out how the tree of life has branched through time, the, the pattern folks, if you will, um, they're using very different kinds of, of data and inferences than people working on process. I say this because it's useful to conceptualize evolution in these, in, as com being composed of these, these three parts because many times students come in having been exposed to creationist literature in which it is very, very common for creationists to say, oh, the Cambrian explosion is a real problem for evolution, therefore evolution didn't happen. 
well, you know, we could talk about the Cambrian explosion for a long time. It's a very interesting topic. But it, if it's a problem at all, it's a problem for how we draw the tree of life. It's not a problem for the inference of common ancestry. See what I mean? People, uh, creationists will argue, oh, natural selection uh, uh, just moves around the genes and maybe can provide something like uh, antibiotic resistance and bacteria or something, but it can't produce something like body plants. It can't do anything that's really, really important. Therefore, evolution didn't happen. That is a similar kind of category mistake, where they are taking research and ideas from a process or mechanism kind of evolutionary biology and implying as if that was evidence against the idea of common ancestry, the big idea of evolution. And that simply is not the case. I mean, these these are category errors. If you're going to criticize common ancestry, then you have to look at the same sorts of, of data and theory that Darwin used uh, to, to come to that inference, which we will be talking about actually in, in a little bit. Now, there's another way of looking at evolution as a big idea and then pattern and process. And this has to do with the nature of science, and this may seem like a tiny digression, but, but stay, stay with me for a moment because it really isn't. Um, a, a, a physicist named uh, Jim Treffel, who uh, writes some very good... Um, uh, Books for the general public on science. He's, he's very, a very good science communicator. Many, many, many years ago, he wrote a, a funny article, and I think it was like Harper's or The Atlantic or some other popular journal, called A Consumer's Guide to Pseudoscience. And he had this really great presentation of the content of science, which I've always liked and I, I've shared with a number of people. Jim talked about science being composed of core ideas that there is a lot of ideas in science which we feel extremely comfortable with, confident in. They've been tested and tested and tested, and they always seem to work, and so as a result, we can consider them core ideas of science. They tend to in, uh, to, to generate new uh, um, uh, questions that we will go out and test and so forth. You know, things like heliocentrism is probably here to stay. Okay. Um, there actually are geocentrists among the creationists, but they're not, you know, they're, they're not a very big movement even among the creationists. I mean, the geocentrism, heliocentrism thing, that's pretty well settled. Uh, things like uh, thermodynamics, um, Mendel's uh, principles of heredity, and the idea of common ancestry, all are these kinds of core ideas. And then Jim said, there are, there's the frontier of science, which is the sort of thing that I imagine Nippon was talking about earlier this morning. Um, this is where the actual research is going on at universities and, and uh, uh, biotech firms around the country. Um, this is where new discoveries are being made. Some of these will be good enough to go into the core. Dirty little secret of science is that most of the stuff we do doesn't work. And it's back to the drawing board again, but that's okay. Uh, that's, that's part of the process. Um, the frontier of science is what you're going to find in the journals. And uh, this is really what, um, you know, what the active part of science. Then he also talked about the fringe. Fringe ideas are ideas that tend to not be taken seriously by scientists because they, t- they violate some core principle of science in some way or another. So as a result, they're highly unlikely to be fruitful approaches to understanding nature. Um, If you go on the Internet and you Google uh, free energy, you will find lots of investment opportunities, okay, to to, uh, uh, buy, uh, you know, to contribute, to buy stock in companies that will solve our energy problems with these various contraptions that will generate energy for free, so to speak. You, they, they will not require fossil fuels. They're very clean. Uh, and they, you just sort of, you know, put them in your living room and you plug your TV in and there you go. But we're not quite there yet, so, you know, we need more investment, but Okay. These are all perpetual motion machines, okay? And the reason why you don't see physicists investing in free energy companies is because they understand the laws of thermodynamics, which are core ideas of science. Similarly, evolutionary biologists don't take seriously the ideas of the creation science proponents that all living things appeared at one time in their present form. Okay, this is leaving God out. Okay, this is leaving out the big C word. Um, the idea that all living things appeared at one time in their present form simply is not supported by lots and lots of scientific evidence. 
Uh, it's not supported by any scientific evidence, and it is contradicted by a huge amount of evidence. So the idea of young Earth creationism is just something that's, that evolutionary biologists don't take seriously. And you can say the same thing for the bacteria flagellum. All right, now back to the, the real thing that I'm talking about. Descent with modification is a core idea of science. The pattern and process kinds of research that goes on are frontier ideas of science. And as I mentioned before, <laughs> pattern or process arguments, uh, disputes and disagreements among scientists about what are the best explanations, tell us nothing about whether living things have common ancestry. That is a core idea of science that um, has not been challenged. So um, we, we do have, you know, we, we, we do have problems with, with students and with the general public in terms of the um, grasping of the big ideas of evolution. I think it's a useful thing to, pre to break evolution down into these three ideas because then students don't think that uh, natural selection equates to evolution or the fossil record equates to evolution. Uh, it makes the it, it's a clearer and more accurate uh, set of concepts. So, what is evolution? Well, we all know evolution is man evolved from monkeys, right? Uh, and obviously, we would include women in this man evolved from monkeys. But man evolved from monkeys is the phrase you hear, which is why I use it. Here. Um, well, obviously, that's not the case. So, we and um, modern chimps shared a common ancestor fairly recently, and we shared a common ancestor with monkeys uh, only much further ago in the past. And by we, I mean the group that includes both humans and apes. Branching and splitting of lineages is what evolution is all about. And this is, this is the big disconnect that I find with the public. They really don't get it. I find that most of the public understands evolution more in terms of an old medieval idea called the great chain of being, <clears throat> which was actually not even medieval, it was actually Aristotelian, where uh, you could rank all of nature from the ins insensible up through the barely sentient uh, lower animals and higher animals and humans, and then of course angels were above humans, and then God was at the head of the great chain of being in, in heaven and so forth. And this ranking would take place in terms of, of complexity, or it could take place in terms of purity, uh, it could take place in terms of closeness to God. There are all kinds of reasons for ranking um, everything from minerals to invertebrates to humans to angels on this great chain of being. But it was certainly a, um, a, a sequential kind of idea, a progressive sequence. And in, the, in medieval times, it got incorporated into uh, Christian theology, although it actually was a, uh, a, an ancient Greek idea. Um, it's interesting when you think about it because our language reflects this great chain of being or ladder of life kind of, of, of um, view of, of reality. Um, have, you, have you ever thought about where the term um, missing link comes from? Chains have links. And if you find a link between one of the chains on the one of the you know uh, links on the great chain of being, then you have provided a missing link, and you are filling out the chain. That's where the you know the, we we have this kind of progressive sort of idea. It's hard to to help people understand what actually goes on because the great chain of being idea is very firmly um, uh, pushed into people's mind. Actually, we and uh, modern day African apes shared a common ancestor fairly recently. We shared a common mammal ancestor. We apes and humans shared a common ma mammal ancestor a little further back in time. The um, mammal group, shall we say, shared a common amniote ancestor with the reptiles uh, further back in time. And we shared a common tetrapod ancestor. We amniotes shared a common tetrapod ancestor with the ancestors of modern uh, amphibians. Now remember, and this is, again is something that our students misunderstand and the public misunderstands, no living creature is ancestral to any other living creature. This is the idea that monkeys are ancestral to us, apes are ancestral to us. No, we and apes shared a common ancestor. And I, I, I use that terminology because, and sometimes my physical anthropology colleagues will say, oh, but the common ancestor would call an ape. Forget it. You know, we're talking, not about what, we're talking not about what you're saying and what your understanding is, but what are people hearing. And when people hear 
your students and when people in the public hear the word ape, they think chimpanzee or gorilla, if they're good. Most of the time they think monkey, because they don't know the difference between monkeys and apes, but that's something else that we have to worry about. So I never use the word ape to refer to the common ancestor of humans and modern-day apes, because what people hear is that apes are the things you see down in the, in the zoo. So, you know, just as a, as a possibility. So, the tetrapod ancestor uh, didn't look anything like modern tetrapods. It was a very, uh, it didn't really look like modern amphibians either, and I think it's an error to refer to this tetrapod ancestor of amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals as an amphibian. Because when people hear amphibian, they think something like toads and salamanders. And this didn't look like a toad or a salamander. It wasn't an amphibian like modern-day amphibians. This idea that, well, we'll get to that in a second. Further back in time, the tetrapod group to which we and all these other varmints belong shared a common ancestor with modern fish. And that ancestral fish didn't look anything at all like goldfish, like the fish on your plate for dinner. It didn't look anything at all like the kind of fish that we are most familiar with. It was a very generalized kind of creature that um, uh, gave rise on, in one set of branches to modern-day fish and to sharks and rays and all those guys, and eventually another branch gave rise to tetrapods. Um, and then you have to go very, very far back in time to the pre-Cambrian or the early Cambrian for a bilaterally symmetrical creature that links the vertebrates with the invertebrates. And, of course, this creature didn't look very much like worm, well, didn't look very much like vertebrates of today. Um, it, we have burrow traces of these Precambrian and early Cambrian bilaterians, and they basically were tubes. Uh, it had a mouth at one end, an anus at another end, uh, and a gut in between, and segments. Given that, <laughs> you can do a lot. Uh, you know, add some appendages to those segments, and you get things that look like Arthropods, and you know, on and on and on. Put a stiffening rod in that um, uh, tube, and you've got something like a chordate. Okay, so starting from that sort of basic tube, you can sort of build a lot. Uh, I don't mean you build a lot, but you know, shall we say, um, embryological processes and natural selection can build a lot. Now, notice in this diagram, you have um, the, these sort of branching and splitting this hierarchical grouping of organisms. Um, getting that across, I think, I think you have an exercise on tree thinking today. Is that going to happen or is that something else? Okay. Um, tree thinking is something that's so hard for students to grasp. Um, I, I'm not nearly as fortunate as you, okay? You have 10 or 15 weeks uh, to, to deal with your students, to try to build up an understanding of these ideas. I do drive-by science, okay? I'm there, I'm there for an hour at some, uh, you know, public uh, lecture or something, and then I go away and I don't have any contact with the people who might have been semi-paying attention to me, you know, during that hour. So uh, my, my job, what I've done is to really, really simplify, but sometimes really simplifying is a good way to start and then you can build on these ideas. And what I've found is to use is something that's useful is to use an analogy that everybody's familiar with. You're trying to get across the idea of hierarchical groupings. You're trying to get across the idea that evolution is this branching and splitting kinds of phenomenon. Somebody, people are always familiar with a, with a family tree uh, because they have descended with modification from common ancestors. So they kind of understand the idea. But if you make it really explicit to them, then, then they can grasp it better when you try to apply it to other living things. So here we go. My sister Sue and I are the children of my father. Dad is the son of Grandpa. Grandpa is also the father of Uncle John. Uncle John's the father of Cousin Liz. Basic principle coming up here, folks. Sue and I look more like each other than we look like Liz. Because Sue and I shared a common ancestor in Dad more recently than we shared a common ancestor with Liz and our grandpa. And you know why? Because of genes. Grandpa passed on genes to dad and my uncle. My dad and my uncle passed on genes to their children. And, uh, you know, every generation uh, the genes get a little bit fewer and fewer. Well, genes are what explains why you are similar and different to people. Um, I inherited, uh, Sue and I inherited more similar genes from dad 
then we inherited similar genes with um, Liz from my grandpa, our grandpa. And genes are sort of the currency that makes this whole system work. Same thing works with other organisms, except now we have to shift from thinking about individuals of mom and dad and grandpa and so forth. Now we have to think in terms of populations, of groups of organizations. And that's another thing that sometimes people have trouble. So be sure you make that change explicit. So bears and dogs look more like each other than they look like lions. Because bears and dogs shared a common dog-like ancestor with each other more recently than they shared a common carnivore ancestor with the lions. Similarly, Cebus and Howler monkeys look more like each other than they look like apes because they shared a common monkey-like ancestor with each other more recently than they shared a common primate ancestor with the apes. But bears and apes look more like each other than they look like salamanders because bears and apes shared a common mammal ancestor with one another than they did with a common vertebrate ancestor with salamanders. And genes are the... The, the foundation for this whole relationship as well. There are mammal genes that are passed down to all mammals. All mammals have four-chambered hearts. So everybody in that cascade further on down has got a four-chambered heart. They all share those same genes. Um, primates have nails instead of claws. So that's one difference between primates and carnivores. The carnivores didn't get those genes that give you nails instead of claws. Good thing for lions. Uh, but for all primates have nails instead of claws. Um, hominoids, the group to which apes and humans belong, have genes that say don't build a tail. Okay, So there's, those genes are different among the apes and humans than they are among monkeys. It's all about genes. Genes are the currency of evolution, just like genes are the currency of the personal relationships that you have in your family tree. The more recently you shared a common ancestor, the more similar you are. But remember, a lot, your, your textbooks get the taxonomy section wrong. The textbooks tell you that you group, group, you group organisms together because they're more similar. Wrong. They are more similar because they shared a common ancestor more recently than with somebody else. It's a very different way of looking at taxonomy, but it's a much more accurate way of looking at taxonomy. And if you can keep, you know, if you keep coming back to genes, this all makes more sense to your students, I think. Okay, let's take a look at the processes of evolution. And I'm not going to um, uh, spend a whole lot of time on this because, you know, there's only so much time uh, in my drive-by uh, uh, science today. But, um, of course, Darwin didn't know what we know today about the genetic underpinning of natural selection. So I'm not going to tell you what Darwin thought, which is basically similar, but you know we can expand Darwin a little bit. Again, remember we're talking about populations, right? We're not talking about individuals. There's this wonderful old state legislator in Iowa years ago um, who every year would introduce a creationism bill to the Iowa legislature. And he would get up there and he would say, I have been a farmer all my life, and I've never seen a chicken turn into a cow. Yep, you're right. <laughs> Chickens are hatched, they're born, and they die. Cows are born, they live, and they die. Individuals don't evolve. Okay? Your students may not know that. A population may evolve. can also go extinct. could also kind of stay pretty much the same way. But populations are what we're talking about. Population thinking, Ernst Mayer was right, it's difficult for people. Let's take a population at one time. Let's take a group of bunnies. So we're looking at some rabbits out in a, in a field. Or actually, one of you was telling me you had a, um, some baby foxes in her yard. How fabulous. Let's make up foxes. Okay. Um, if you look at all those foxes, uh, they're not identical because they've inherited different genes, right? Recombination and so forth. And so there's variation that exists in that group of, of uh, foxes out there. Not everyone is the same. Some have slightly longer tails, slightly bushier tails. Some have a little different in, co different in color, maybe more or less red. Uh, they will also have biochemical differences. They'll have um, slight differences in uh, the various kinds of enzymes and so forth that, that make them work. Now, we actually know a fair amount about 
where that genetic variation comes from. And actually there's uh, research going on to try to improve our understanding. But basically we're talking about a series of ge genetic factors like recombination, mutation, non-random mating, and so forth, that every generation swap the genes around in every population. And this is something that we know just from the principles of genetics is going to happen. There will always be new variation coming into the population. This is what Darwin didn't know. Darwin didn't know how he was going to be able to get enough variation every generation when it looked to him like natural selection should be winnowing down the variation. But he didn't know anything about genetics and all these various uh, components of, of heredity that cause variation to occur every generation. So... Good. Now every generation we have uh, new variation coming into the population, but this population of organisms has to survive in an environment. And the environment is going to provide various challenges, uh, challenges having to do with the physical environment, heat, light, so forth, uh, how much moisture is there. This can be very important, uh, too much or too little. Uh, can you find nesting sites? Can you find mates? Can you find food? Can you keep from being somebody else's food? There's a lot of things that, that factor into whether an organism is going to survive in this uh, particular population, in this particular environment. And, of course, this is where natural selection comes in. Those organisms that happen to have the variation that allow them to do better in that particular environment at that particular time are the ones who are more likely to pass on their genes. And as a result of this... New, new generation coming into the population every generation, sorry, new variation coming into the population every generation. And every generation, the variation being acted upon by all these various environmental factors, you have uh, the prospect for evolutionary change. And what happens if you take this process and do it generation after generation after generation? It's called evolution if you tuck in speciation, but I'll talk about speciation a little bit. Um, you know, it's so funny. Uh, I think if you, if you understand genetics and if you accept genetics uh, as being a real thing, as, you know, I mean, people really do pass on stuff every generation. There's dominance, recessiveness. There's all this other stuff. There's DNA. If you really understand and accept what you read in the textbook about, gen about genetics... You have to, and, and you understand the concept of adaptation, and that's something that students grasp. How can you avoid accepting evolution, although it is done? Uh, heredity plus adaptation plus time equals evolution. It is inevitable. Sometimes teachers say, well, when should evolution be taught? Well, my feeling is that, middle, is that um, middle and upper elementary school is a time where concepts of heredity and adaptation and time are already coming into the curriculum. Okay? Um, lots of times elementary school teachers will stretch a big string across the, um, the playground, you know, and Jimmy, you go stand where the, uh, um, where the um, uh, fish first arrived, and you, Mary, you stand where the... Uh, um, uh, mammals first arrived, and you know, anyway, you know, they, they 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 try to get across the idea that there's been a lot of time. Um, most, if not all, elementary school teachers do something on ad adaptation. It may be a protective coloration kind of uh, um, uh, uh, exercise. It may be the the you know beak, um, what do you call it? bird beaks, you know, maybe. But and so the idea of adaptation is out there among uh, elementary school uh, students. Um, the idea of heredity is, is less frequently taught um, specifically at, the, uh, at K-6, but, you know, by about upper elementary, sometimes in some school districts, depending, of course, on, on the state and, and the uh, science frameworks, um, the, the science standards, sometimes you're getting some age-appropriate ideas about, you know, stuff does get passed on from generation to generation, and here's how it works. Certainly by middle school, all of these concepts of heredity, adaptation, and time are extant. Uh, they've been developed. Students have an idea about these three ideas. It's very easy to put them together logically. And when you put them together logically, you get evolution. The cumulative change in organisms over time and their descent with modification. Uh, let's talk about the patterns of evolution. 
Um, so how do we determine patterns? Well, we determine patterns by the principle of homology. Now, this is going to get tricky because homology is defined as similarity of common, uh, due to common ancestry. But don't confuse the definition of homology with the um, practice of constructing trees. Otherwise, you do get in a tautological kind of, of, uh, uh, of, of circle here. We don't assume evolution when constructing trees, but evolution emerges because the similarities and differences result in hierarchical groupings, and this process of evolution does generate hierarchy. It's the, it's the logical inference that you would make from the various hierarchical groupings that you get when applying differences and similarities of traits. Let me just show... Um, and. And you see this kind of relationship in anatomy, you see it in behavior, you find it in biochemical and molecular um, data as well, and you find it in embryological data. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but you know, if we look at the bones and teeth of a group of mammals, um, you know, a kind of, of if we look at the bones and teeth of a group of, of mammals that eat meat, <laughs> we find that they tend to cluster into two groups that we could call cats. And uh, this would be, you know, most familiarly things like uh, house cats and lions and tigers and uh, lynxes, like in this picture here. But we also find that they, they link with civets and hyenas and certain other groups. There's another whole branch of these meat-eating animals that we can call dogs. And they in include dogs and wolves and foxes like we're most familiar with. But bears also cluster with this group when you look at bones and teeth. And a little bit further removed, you find the, um, the weasel group also clusters with this. And of course, this is the caniforms and the feliforms, um, the animals that are related to the very familiar dogs and cats. Now, you're probably somewhat familiar with DNA hybridization. Uh, if you take um, DNA from two species and you heat it up, you can break the bonds between the uh, uh, strands of DNA. Uh, you let them cool on down and then you mix them together and you find that um, some combinations of species will have more um, uh, annealing, if you will, and more pairing than others. If you take the degree of pairing of these DNA strands and you um, plot that just like you can plot the data that comes from similarities and differences based on bones and teeth, uh, you get a very similar sort of thing. You find in the cat group, you find that um, cats uh, group with hyenas and with civets, and over here in the dog group, you find dogs grouping with bears. You find the same sort of thing with DNA evidence as you find with uh, anatomical evidence. And you can do the same thing with um, with um, uh, embryology as well. Um, embryological relationships have interested evolutionary biologists for a very long time. Ernst Haeckel in the 19th century was, was an early enthusiast of the idea that you could uh, study in, in, uh, embryos of different groups and again compare their similarities and differences. The more recently, the more similar the groups, he inferred that they had a more recent common ancestor and so forth. <laughs> Now, creationists make a great deal of the claim, and I say it's a claim because it would take us a long time to dissect it, but the claim that Haeckel's embryos are fraudulent, that he uh, just merely drew them all to look alike, and that all of his research was bogus. Um, unfortunately, like anything else coming from the creationists, don't trust and verify. Um, there's um, uh, two books where you're likely to find these kinds of, of claims, Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells and Explore Evolution, a more recent publication from the uh, Discovery Institute. And uh, these books uh, claim that embryology has um, nothing to do with evolution, that there's no link whatsoever between the um, um, data and theory that's coming out of developmental biology laboratories around the country. Uh, Nipa, I'm sorry, your work is just, you know, you, you're not doing evolution, according to these guys. Got nothing to do with it. Uh, they're very fond of taking the work of a man by the name of Michael Richardson, who is a uh, developmental biologist in Great Britain, and uh, Richardson is appalled at the misuse of his uh, research by the, by the intelligent design and, and other creationists. And uh, as I say, I could spend many hours on this, but you know, let me just refer you to a quotation from 
uh, Richardson that doesn't sound like he has doubts about uh, either Haeckel, um, nor does he have doubts about evolutionary biology being very closely related to uh, our understanding of evolution. And uh, this is actually uh, uh, some of uh, Richardson's data. Um, the um, colors uh, represent um, different clades or different uh, uh, groupings of related animals. Basically, what Haeckel was showing back in the uh, 19th century is still correct. The more recently two forms have shared a common ancestor, the more similar they are. He used vertebrate classes, and the relationships still hold. If you take a look at the pink ones, those are mammals, and you'll notice that the mammal um, embryos, which are human, bat, cat, and possum, I'm not sure how well the, uh, the, scale sh the um, uh, legend shows up on top, you know, they look more like each other than they look like the amphibians or like, like the uh, 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 reptile uh, bird group. Um, the more recent, because the mammals shared a more recent common ancestor with each other than they shared a, an earlier amniote ancestor with the diapsid reptiles. Um, the other point that uh, Haeckel noted, which is still uh, correct based on modern data, is that Within a group, um, there is more similarity. Uh, I'm sorry. There is more. Sorry. There is more similarity earlier in embryological uh, development than later. And you know, if you just take a look at the pink mammal guys there, um, the the earlier embryos look rather more similar to one another than they do look like the finished product, so to speak. You know, bats and humans are pretty distinguishable, uh, as you know just being ready to be born, whereas uh, at very very early stages of embryological development, that is not the case. Now, of course, Haeckel was a little confused about why this was the case, and his biogenetic law had to do with the uh, um, supposed uh, reproduction of all evolutionary stages in the embryo, and you know that, that part doesn't work. But the big principles that uh, Haeckel was dealing with are still quite valid. The more recently you shared a common ancestor, the more similar you are, and earlier there are more similarities earlier in embryological development within a group than later. Um, what is this? I don't know. Oh, that's, never mind. <laughs> that was supposed to be a blank slide. Forget it. Uh, but perhaps the most significant contribution of developmental biology to evolutionary studies is the development of a subfield called evolution and development, abbreviated as EvoDevo. Uh, there are some, I think there's even a journal called EvoDevo, isn't there? <laughs> and there's, I think, also one called Evolution and Development, so if you can spell it all out or you can just abbreviate it. The last 20 or 30 years or so, molecular genetics techniques have made substantial contributions to developmental biology. There's been this wonderful cross-fertilization. And interestingly <laughs> enough, it's really re-stimulated the interest of developmental biologists in, in evolutionary biology. So whereas Haeckel was trying to put them, put them together back in the... Um, uh, 1800s, they sort of drifted apart in the uh, uh, early to mid 20th century. Now they're coming back together again. And one of the things that's um, being shown that I suspect, uh, since it is coming into your textbooks now in, in uh, uh, more detail, is this idea of early acting genes, which uh, appear to be conserved across very, very different groups of organisms. Uh, here's a mouse and a fruit fly. And you can see that some of these early acting genes, this is, happens to be Hox clusters, um, are, are homologous. They are, um, they are the same and, and they, are, they occur in the same order. And they tend to do the same sort of thing. Uh, they, they tend to be genes that lay out your basic body plan. You know, here, here's the front, here's the back, here's the top, here's the bottom, here's the left, here's the right. Build a segment here, stop building tails there. I mean, these are genes that that are extremely important for these early body plan kinds of, of uh, developments, which, of course, is directly related to evolutionary biology and our understanding of how, um, how organisms have diversified through, through life. So uh, embryology and the homologies that come from embryology are very important in constructing trees. Now, um, whoops, wasn't there... Um, Oh, yeah, body plan. Sorry about that. I changed the slide really this morning, which is a mistake. All right, let, let me move on. <laughs> um, what is the goal of biology education? 
Well, I would suggest that it is help, to help students understand biology. I have very uh, uh, modest uh, intents for, for this, this field of yours. Um, but seriously, understanding is more than just knowing the parts of things, which unfortunately, particularly because of No Child Left Untested, um, it's a great, there's a lot of pressure to teach the parts of things because, of course, it's much, much easier to test. Uh, and goodness knows biology is chock full of parts and things that you can memorize. But I want to call your attention to uh, Richard Feynman's um, wonderful uh, uh, phrase. He was talking about physics t students. And he found that his MIT student, uh, physics students were absolutely brilliant they, uh, they knew everything, but as he said, they didn't know what anything meant. Uh, he found that the students could give them the formulas of everything, tell them the parts of all of those physics things that they were studying. But they couldn't tell him anything about how nature worked. He, they, they did not have any kind of big picture. Now, the lovely thing about biology is we have a big picture. Everyone is familiar with Dubjansky's famous aphorism, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. That's the title of the article that he wrote in ABT back in the 70s. But I want to call your attention to what he wrote within the article because that tells you what he means. I've heard some biologists say, oh, well, that, you know, that's a silly thing to say because obviously you can understand biology without evolution. That isn't what he was talking about. What he wrote was... Seen in the light of evolution, biology is perhaps intellectually the most satisfying and inspiring science. Of course, we all agree with that. <laughs> Without that light, it becomes a pile of sundry facts, some of, them, some of them interesting or curious, but making no meaningful picture as a whole. That's what he's talking about. He's, telling, he's saying that biology... That, that evolution makes sense of biology in that it tells you why things are like they are rather than some other way. An example that I often use with public uh, audiences is, is why do all tetrapods have four legs? You know, these are the land vertebrates. Well, so somebody's, well, you know, two legs and two leg, two legs in uh, front and two legs in back is the best way to get around on land. Therefore, vertebrates have four legs. And then you point out insects that are getting around on land just fine with six legs. Or you mentioned uh, arachnids, which get around on land just fine with eight legs. And then you have millipedes, which have a whole bunch of legs, and they get along on land just fine. So there's nothing special about having four limbs to move around on land. Why is it that tetrapods have four limbs rather than six or eight or, well, fortunately not millipedes, but um, that wouldn't happen. But why is it that... that we tetrapods, uh, amphibians, reptiles, fish, uh, excuse me, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, why do all the tetrapods have only <laughs> four limbs? Well, it's because we are descended from an aquatic vertebrate that had two legs in front and two legs in back, or two limbs in front and two limbs in back, because that's kind of the minimum number of limbs that you need if you're going to move around in a three-dimensional space. If you're going to go forward, backward, left, right, up, and down, which is what you have to do as a fish. Now, wouldn't it have been cool if the ancestral um, uh, aquatic vertebrate, notice I'm not calling it a fish, right? Because when you say fish, people think of something that you know swims around in a bowl. They think of a ray fin. And you don't want to, you want them to think of this funny little, you know, little generalized environment um, that was an, a vertebrate, but nothing that looked very much like a modern fish at all. Okay, so wouldn't it have been really, really cool if this ancestral aquatic vertebrate had had six limbs? Yeah, it wouldn't have been impossible just to, to hang another, um, another set of, of uh, limbs off a little further back in the uh, thoracic uh, vertebral column. We could do that. <laughs> That's possible. You know, wouldn't sports be so much more interesting if we had, you know, if we, if we had four, four arms to toss basketballs around? You could have a lot of fun with your students on this. But we don't. The reason why terrestrial vertebrates have four limbs is because we are descended from, luck of the draw, an aquatic vertebrate that had four limbs. Um, so 
there's lots and lots of examples, and I'll talk about some of them, as to why evolution makes sense of biology. But you might be interested, this is a, um, a, uh, a fairly large, it's about a yard uh, in diameter, um, uh, insert into the floor of a large Midwestern university. And you see where it begins there, nothing in biology makes sense in the light of evolution. It's Dobzhansky's quote. Do you know where this is? Do you know what large uh, Midwestern university this occurs in? Kansas, smart aleck. Notre Dame. And if anybody wants a copy of the slide, I can provide it to you. <laughs> All right. The field of biology is sometimes divided into three themes. Um, each of these themes, I will suggest to you, makes more sense if you understand that living things have common ancestors. The themes, of course, are function, uh, diversity, and unity. And these are kind of useful ways of um, uh, thinking about and you know, you can even, there's a lot of biology that gets taught using one or more of these themes. I want to talk about function first. Now, Atul Gawande is a wonderful writer. I read articles by him in The New Yorker and elsewhere. He's a marvelous, he's a physician and he, he writes uh, things about science and policy and so forth. And I was struck by an article that he wrote in 2007 um, about uh, ger uh, gerontology, actually. And he was talking about um, um, why, why uh, uh, organs wear out. Let me just read you the quote. He said, engineers design machines with multiple layers of redundancy, with backup systems and backup systems for the backup systems. The backups may not be as efficient as the first line components, but they allow the machine to keep going even as damage accumulates. So-and-so argues that within the parameters established by our genes, that's exactly how human beings appear to work. We have an extra kidney, an extra lung, an extra gonad, extra teeth. Well, I would suggest that that's actually the wrong way to look at it. We don't have two kidneys so that if one fails, the other will keep us going. We have two kidneys because we are bilaterally symmetrical. And this is nothing unique to us. And I think an understanding of evolution helps on that. Let's just take a little break here and kind of think about the tree of life in a big way. Life, all right? <laughs> Most of it is single-celled, but you have these things called eukaryotes, the, like us, with nucleated cells. So we're going to talk about these from here on in. Um, most eukaryotes, of course, uh, just like everything else on Earth, is single-celled. But there are metazoa. There are the eukaryotes that have uh, live in more than live with more than one cell together, like us. And this includes plants and animals. Uh, this diagram is hard enough to understand uh, with just animals, so I'm going to make the plants disappear. For which I apologize for all of you botanists, but otherwise it's even crazier to try to look at this. Um, among the animals, then, we'll just talk about um, uh, the ones that are bilaterally symmetrical, the bilateria. Okay, and these are all clades. You know, they, these are all you know these are all creatures that share combinations. The further down this cascade that you go, so basically, bilateral symmetry results in paired organs. Mammals and human beings are way down here. It's not that we have an extra kidney in order to keep us going if the first one fails. You could say the same thing about, uh, about um, crustaceans or insects or echinoderms or amphibians. They have paired organs as well. And it's not for you know, mechanical redundancy. It's because we happen to be built on a body plan that's bilaterally <laughs> symmetrical. Um, there's a lot of good examples of function where you can bring in evolution. And it's really a lot of fun for your students, too. My, one of my favorites is the recurrent laryngeal nerves. Um, recurrent, by the way, is kind of a, um, a, uh, an archaic uh, uh, medical um, term for um, something that goes back and comes and returns again. You know, it goes out and back, basically, and, and this is what you will see happens here. If you look at fish, you've got the sixth dorsal artery that provides blood to the heart. Well, by golly, the same sort of thing happens. Um, that, that sixth dorsal artery uh, shows up in a, a vertebrate heart, like a human being as well. But the heart's been dropped down into the chest. It's not up there close to the head. And there's been some reworking of it, and, and it has a slightly different function here. Um, so that's fine. Um, the 
nerve, uh, the fourth vagus nerve that innervates that artery, uh, accompanies it right. It's, it's right close by in the um, in the fish, and it's sort of you know conveniently arranged. But unfortunately, in a something like a mammal, it's this big long nerve that starts up near the head and loops way down close to the sixth dorsal artery where. You know, embryologically, it, it, it used to be very close to it, and then all the way back on up again to the to the head. Now, this is an odd structure, especially if you look at something like a giraffe, in which the recurrent laryngeal nerve is 14 feet long. Now, this is not an ideal design here. Why would you have a nerve that loops way the heck down into the thorax of a mammal and then all the way back up again, wouldn't there be a slightly similar way of, of innervating this, uh, this particular um, set of organs? Well, you know, certainly, if we could design things from scratch, we'd do things a whole lot better off. Um, obviously, common ancestry and the remodeling of things that take place through evolution is the best explanation for the for the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. You can also work in structure and function in cell biology as well. You're familiar with the um, uh, Lynn Margulis's hypothesis about uh, mitochondria actually being aerobic bacteria uh, that were ingested uh, by an early anaerobic cell and developed a symbiotic relationship to it. Same thing, chloroplasts and eukaryotic plant cells uh, have a lot of similarities to cyanobacteria, and this is true on the molecular level as well. So through endosymbiosis, you end up with um, modern cells that uh, have these composites of other structures. Uh, eukaryotes are like they are because of evolution. Evolution makes sense of the fact that you've got mitochondria that has its own RNA, which is a really kind of a silly thing for, you know, because you've already got material for reproducing the cell in the DNA. Um, if we go to diversity, clearly evolution helps us understand diversity. I've already talked a lot about that. Um, the patterns of evolution are determined, um, or the current diversity of organisms are determined uh, largely by evolution. But I, you, we need to kind of add one more principle to that. I talked about heredity, adaptation, and time equals evolution. That's sort of the little formula. You know, that's the drive-by view uh, when you want, you know, the next lecture. Uh, the, the next little deeper level is that you also have to talk about speciation. You also have to talk about the splitting of these populations into groups that are no longer um, able to share genes. Um, adaptation itself does not produce new species. You have to have the establishment of isolating mechanisms, which can vary, uh, which can, can be quite varied. Isolating mechanisms, the things that keep those two populations from exchanging genes, they could be behavioral. Uh, we reproduce at different time of the year than they do, so eventually we're not. We're going to diverge. Uh, it could be um, uh, chromosomal or um, you know, various kinds of uh, pre-mating and, and even some immediately post-mating mechanisms that, that prevent the egg and the sperm from fertilizing each other for various reasons. can be ecological um, we, um, uh, uh, or even geographical. Um, there's various ways that you can interrupt the, uh, the flow of genes between populations. Um, the um, process of speciation in, in the most general uh, form takes, um, take, takes two forms, so to speak. Let's say we have a population, we'll call it A. Um, if, we, if we run time up the chart here, um, over time that population may vary just as a result of, of uh, adaptation and natural selection working on it. And over a period of time it may differ s sufficiently that we would just call it B because as a time series uh, the creatures that we see at time level A are at uh, time level B are very, very different from those of A. Properly speaking, it's probably not a real new species, but sometimes in paleontology this is done. You find this actually a lot in, in uh, human evolutionary studies. The more um, uh, a tidier way of looking at speciation and the way that it probably occurs <laughs> most frequently is you have uh, population A, and um, uh, it gets separated in, in some fashion 
from the uh, uh, species as a whole. Uh, it is no longer able to exchange genes for some reason or another. Sometimes this can be geographic isolation. There's interesting work about whether sympatric speciation actually can occur or whether they're just poorly understood geographic speciation. But anyway, for our purposes here, uh, lineage splits. It no longer is exchanging genes. And isolating mechanisms um, develop so that over time, this population does produce a new species, which is very different from the species that began originally. And we have lots of examples of populations that are fully diverged, that don't exchange genes, and others that are only partly diverged, um, such as horses and lions, which are living in, sorry, horses and donkeys. <laughs> horses and lions, in fact, do not exchange genes. Um, <laughs> One may be digested by the other, but they do not exchange genes. Uh, lions and tigers are another example of sort of an incomplete speciation. They can still exchange genes, but the um, products that are produced from lion-tiger matings uh, are not uh, fertile. So effectively, they are, they are uh, separate species. Um, some populations appear to be in the act of speciating, such as ring species, and this is a completely... Um, uh, more complicated diagram than, it, than I should be showing on a um, screen, but since this is a small room, I, I took a chance to do it. Um, this is a, a, a cute little, um, um, I think it's a warbler um, over here that uh, is um, uh, extant across um, most of Central Asia. The blue refers to one species, uh, a, a series of populations um, that contains certain um, biochemical characteristics. And um, in the Tibetan Plateau is a real barrier. Uh, birdies can't exactly fly over it. Uh, there aren't a lot of seeds up there to eat, and it's really, really uh, tall, and it's very cold. So it acts as an effective barrier to this particular species of, of warbler for um, um, getting across. Um, but on the edge of the plateau, um, you, you, on the edge of the Himalayas, you do get populations of this little warbler. And in fact, it extends all the way into um, Siberia. But interestingly enough, these warblers cannot interbreed with the original population. It's almost as if, um, you know, if, if you're seeing what's taking place in geographic space, what is very likely to have taken place through time. Uh, a population that starts with one set of variation and then at a longer period of time ends up with another and indeed would not have been able to exchange genes. But here we see the so same sort of general principle taking place across geographic areas. We have examples of that right here in California with, uh, with the uh, uh, Ancetina species of salamander. There's also a bee, Hoplitis. The classic example is seagulls of Laris argentatus. Lots of ring species are around and they're very a very good way of demonstrating how genes are the currency of evolution. Genes are the currency of adaptation as well. Let's uh, speak very, oops, I guess I was going to talk about that, but then change my mind, so let's move along. Let's talk about unity, because um, I'm getting close to where we should be going here. We see unity of living things, this, this great theme of biology that's often used as, uh, as a way of bringing it together. Reflecting evolution in the sense that there is a continuity within biology that's reflected in uh, genes and biochemistry, it's reflected in descent, reflected in form that we've talked about a little bit. It's also affected, it's also repeated uh, in ecosystems and adaptation. Again, genes are, are really the heart of this. Genes are passed down from population to population. Therefore, evolution tells us the more recently two forms shared a common ancestor, the more similar they are, and that all the descendants of a clade are going to have similar characteristics. And interestingly enough, the earlier you look in the clade, the more similar the characteristics that will be um, seen to, to cascade down and unite that clade. Um, uh, let me just sort of skip up to uh, this one. Um, this is kind of a macro tree of life here. We start with an ancestral animal. It is a single-celled organism. Uh, sponges, of course, are asymmetrical. But um, I'm going to move on here until, uh, well, and uh, jellyfish are radial, radially symmetrical, but let me move on to bilateral symmetry here. 
Um, all of these creatures sort of above the flatworm levels, that are, so to speak, on the left-hand uh, um, uh, index of this illustration, have bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry was, um, uh, came about very, very early in animal and metazoan evolution. And all of the creatures all the way up have this particular case. Um, segmentation is something that occurred uh, only um, among some of us metazoa. You notice that most of the uh, metazoa really you know, aren't segmented. Um, you look at the deuterostomes and the protostomes, and all deuterostomes have the same uh, basic embryological characteristic of where the blastopore forms. It forms at the anus end. Protostomes, all of them have the same characteristic the blastopore forming at the mouth end. Uh, those very early acting characteristic will characterize all of the organisms within that plate. That is a type of unity. Uh, you know, it's sort of you stand back, you see the whole tree, that's diversity. You get in close and you look at, at the descendants of a clade and that gives you the unity. Um, moving to an... Um, Ecological orientation, the unity exists there as well. Evolution allows for adaptation into ecological niches. These adaptations keep occurring as long as there are environments or niches to occupy. Um, at one point, a niche of browsing on um, vegetable food that uh, occurs very high up was occupied by reptiles. Today, it's occupied by a mammal form. Similarly, there was a niche that was occupied back in the Permian by an amphibian, which involves living in a, a, a lacustrine or freshwater <coughs> environment and um, capturing prey, prey by the use of stealth and very, very rapid uh, seizure and um, uh, um, you know, crushing, uh, killing. We call those people crocodiles today. That same niche exists. It's, it's, there's a unity of niche. It is occupied by different forms at different times. There's an aquatic, uh, a marine niche of a large-bodied predator of fish. Um, we call them dolphins today. Uh, there is that, uh, you, coral reefs, um, uh, the, the reef kind of environment is occupied by corals today was occupied by uh, brachiopods in the past. The, the, the environments remain, they, there's a unity of environment that is filled by different organisms over time. Um, I think Dubjansky was right. Uh, evolution tells you why things are the way they are in biology rather than some other way. And I think thinking about how common ancestry explains whatever the topic you are teaching is going to help to make biology make more sense for your students. We have too much of this already. Um, Feynman is right. Uh, they know all the details. They know all the formulas, but they don't know what anything means. And what, it, what so much of biology means is that there's been a fabulous history of cumulative change through time in biological organisms. And it's nice to give them the big picture. Uh, for more big picture, <laughs> at ncsc.com, which is our website, um, if you go to uh, this news alerts button here, you can sign up for a free Friday electronic newsletter. Uh, Glenn Branch puts it out. It's excellent. It's short. It's just bulleted points with links if you want to follow up and learn more about whatever events are going on. If you go to the news button up here on top, um, you can sort for California or whatever state you are interested in. You can sort by year. You can pull up the news articles that we've been accumulating for a long time. Uh, we're a membership organization, so it would be lovely if you would join. Um, we are uh, the National Center for Science Education. And my colleagues are the uh, Deputy Director, Glenn Branch. Louise Mead, you will meet a little bit later on. We're going to get her a new picture because she, she doesn't like that one. <laughs> but I think she's lovely anyway, no matter what. Uh, Robert Lunn is our communications um, uh, officer. Peter Hess is faith community outreach. And then the flare-ups wranglers who are... Uh,